Independent School District 535 School Board is called to order at 530 Tuesday, March the 5th, 2019 in room 137 of the Edison Building. Present at the board table is Mr. Michael Munoz, Superintendent of Schools, and a non-voting ex-officio member of the board. Also present is Ms. Wendy Edgar, the Assistant Board Clerk. Ms. Edgar, would you please call the roll? Ms. Amundsen? Here. Chair Barlow? Here. Ms. Marvin? Here. Ms. Nathan? Here. Mr. Susner? Here. Ms. Seelinger? Here. Ms. Workman? Here. Let's stand if you're able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Action item, approval agenda. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Announcements and communications. Mr. Munoz. All right, uh, this evening we want to celebrate uh, per professional. This is the per professional week, and we'd like to send out a huge thank you to the over 700 dedicated per professionals that work in our district. These individuals are dedicated and committed. They're advocates for and support our students in so many ways. These staff absolutely make a difference in our students' lives each and every day. And Rochester Public School students and fellow staff are grateful. So thank you for all of those who are there. I also want to read a proclamation that the governor has today. Whereas Minnesota is home to more than 28,000 paraprofessionals who provide services in multiple settings within schools, including support for instruction, for student activities, and for individual students, as well as numerous other tasks that contribute to educational success and whereas the support and services provided by paraprofessionals are integral to student achievement, resulting in even better, more effective Minnesota schools, and whereas the state of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Education are committed to excellence in education and recognize the important role that paraprofessionals play in assuring educational success, and whereas the Minnesota Department of Education will celebrate the contributions of paraprofessionals during paraprofessional, say that together really quick, <laughs> recognition week, which runs from March 3rd through March 9th, 2019. Now, therefore, I, Tim Walls, governor of Minnesota, dear here, do hereby proclaim the week of March 3rd through the 9th, 2019, as paraprofessional recognition week. We do have a video I'd like to sh uh, share with you. I do know we have members of that group. If you could stand, and we'd like to recognize all of them and thank them very much. Big thanks to our 37 school social workers for all you do for kids. School social workers are the vital link in the school community. You not only counsel children, but staff as well. 
You bring students, teachers, and parents together to work towards understanding and success. You calm the disruptive child so the teacher can get back to educating, and you help kids prevent and resolve conflicts, making the building a better place. You are a voice for those kids and families who can't find the courage or words to express their needs. You connect parents with resources and, in some cases, coordinate educational and outside care to help families be less overwhelmed. And for some situations, you find resources for physical needs, such as food and housing. You support the school and the people in it, helping kids and teachers be ready to learn every day. And I have another proclamation that I'd like to read. Whereas the school social workers in the state of Minnesota and across the nation have been a vital link between school, home, and community for more than 100 years, and whereas school social workers are valuable members of the multidisciplinary team serving schools, providing a wide range of services to students, parents, and staff, and whereas school social workers are professionally trained to understand the needs of students who face challenges that interfere with their learning, and whereas school social workers have expertise in many areas such as mental health, interventions, human growth and behavior, impact the family dynamics on student achievement, child abuse and neglect, chemical health and community resources, and whereas school social workers contribute to a productive educational environment, actively working toward the improvement of our schools and youth. Now therefore, I, Tim Walls, Governor of Minnesota, do hereby proclaim the week of March 3rd through the night, 2019, as School Social Worker Week. So I don't know if we have any of our social workers in the audience. I think we, if you could stand, please. Thank you. All right, whereas I don't like reading proclamations, we're gonna move on to something different. <laughs> This is a scene that we're probably all really sick and tired of seeing. And uh, tonight I want to recognize some individuals who uh, a lot of you don't see what goes on behind the scene. What you see is schools counseled and you jump up and down and everybody's happy. But there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes uh, to get things going. Here's one picture, this is uh, outside our, our vans are kind of parked in a building behind that big uh, drift. Uh, this is Franken Elementary, if you can notice. Uh, this was a little difficult for uh, people to get in, so they had to uh, do some large digging out there. Uh, here's uh, a little work at Ferdell that, uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, shovels bit the dust here. <laughs> And then a lot of you, the media put a lot, uh, focused a lot on the snow on the roof. So these are some of the pictures of how uh, they went about removing that snow that was on the roof. Here's them uh, blowing snow off the roof at the gate or sentry. And this is the important <laughs> incident command room where all the decisions, how are we going to go about this? And, and interesting part which you didn't know behind the scenes is they looked at all of our sites and prioritized which ones we need to get after right away, what's the next level and the next level after that. So that all happened in the incident command room. <laughs> Here's some more pictures of uh, snow removal at Sunset Terrace. This was probably one of our most challenging ones because of where the snow was located. So, as I said, a lot happens behind schools closed today. Well, there's a lot that happens, not only the actual removal of the snow, but there's individuals at this on my side here that we're on the phone or we do, I don't know, Heather's figured out how we can all talk together at the same time. I just answer it when it calls and then <laughs> there's a bunch of people on the line. But uh, we monitor the snow. We're constantly watching that about four different uh, sources we look at. And we're talking constantly because once a decision made, there's a lot of work that Heather's department has to do and Heather specifically has to do to get the message out to all of the people. And we have a specific order that we follow when we do that. So there's a lot that happens behind the scene that um, most people don't see. 
the snow you saw, um, we had people week working on Saturday and even Sunday up on a roof on a Sunday when it was very cold Sunday, removing snow so we could have school on Monday at those sites. So uh, tonight I would like to specifically recognize first Heather for all of the time she had to put in working with us on communications. Scott kind of running the show for his department. Uh, and he was up even, that was his shovel that was broke, so he was up there uh, scooping as well. Uh, but also would like to thank the supervisors uh, with, and the personnel crew that managed the snow removal, roof inspections and removal of snow from the roofs. Andrew, Andrew is coordinator of facilities. If, if you're here, if you could stand up and stay standing. Uh, Jerry Ernst, coordinator of maintenance. Uh, Jim Allheiser, assistant coordinator of maintenance. He managed the maintenance staff and snow removal from sites and the roofs. Bill Burt coordinator of uh, construction services, Cole Nelson, construction service assistant, managed the roof inspections and snow removal from roofs. Uh, Mike Stock, coordinator of health and safety, managed the gas line issue at Gage and safe, uh, safety at Gage during roof issues events. Uh, building maintenance for the site maintenance staff uh, who take care of the sidewalks and, all, and that big drift in front of the doors that you saw. And we really kind of want, to be honest, we really had an awesome plan to kind of <laughs> introduce this, but Scott said we couldn't do it. But we had a song that was called Roof Top Heroes. <laughs> and if we would have had one more day to prep, we would have been out here doing that for you. But you're, you're probably lucky we didn't have that extra day. But really, I want to thank these individuals. There was a lot of snow that they had to remove, and, and they gave their weekends up to uh, make that happen. So let's give all of them a hand. All right. All right. Last thing, then I'll sit down. Uh, the Rochester Alternative Learning Center received the 2019 Program of the Year Award. Uh, the Program of the Year has uh, three categories or three things that you need to uh, be judged on. The program school must provide a model and leadership, uh, curriculum, structure, outreach, outcomes, and innovation from which other schools or programs can take inspiration. The program of school should reflect the vision and mission of the organization, and the program school must ha have active uh, membership to their organization. So please join me in recognizing the Rochester Alternative Learning Center for the amazing work they do for students every day. And we have many of them there. So if you guys could stand up. Thank you, Mr. Munoz, uh, for inviting us and recognizing us. I just want to say thank you to the staff. I think probably the most important thing as principal to do is to just hire good, good people and then just get out of their way and let them do their magic and work with their kids. And, uh, you know, the running joke at the ALC is we just try to stay in the down low. And as school board members know and uh, media people know, we had kind of a big day yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And so we're ready to go back and just into the down low <laughs> and uh, just do the work that is. But staff, thank you for your patience, persistence, and uh, grit that you show every day working with our kids. And you really tru ma truly make it a very special place. Uh, we had some staff that put together a little uh, video that sort of shows the public uh, what happens day to day. And uh, I think it's going to be ready to go. Kurt? Not that one. Not that one. No, no more snow. There we go. Okay, and Kurt promised me that the audio was going to work. So. <laughs> In the past, I guess, I've struggled at home and with uh, just resources like 
shampoo, you know, food, regular stuff, deodorant, whatever. But uh, here they provide, they'll help you out with all that. If you can't get to school, they'll give you gas cards, just make it as easy as possible for you to get what you need to get done. and a lot more open to people and they're very accepting here. student here has their own like story and their own way of working so that's what I like about things. So you actually start off at your own pace, you work your credits up, they build, like, they help you out a lot, the counselors, teachers, everybody do. Like, all the teachers in the school are just incredibly helpful as well. You can go to them and ask them a question, and they'll be very willing to help you as well. So that's very nice. school I probably would still be in ninth grade if you know just cause like how bad my anxiety and depression was then it, it just made it hard for me to go to class and talk to the teachers and ask questions but here like the teachers here you can actually relate to like that that some of the teachers here like I, I can talk to just about my personal life what's going on you know I don't I don't need to go to a therapist I can just talk to them like I it's great it makes things easier when you can trust the people around you to help you out and never kick you when you're down or just make sure that you have everything you need to be where you're at and help you further along the line to be a successful person in life. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Item 3.02, Apex Recovery School. This is informational, uh, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time I'm going to call uh, Marion Holtoff, Program Educator, Amy Stites, and Megan Wilgenbush. Sorry, I don't have your titles or positions with this. So. Yes. No, those are for the, those are for the kids. Yeah. Just sit anymore. in front of a mic so we can pick yeah. your sound, pick you up. Welcome, thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, I think what we'll do is we will just tell you a little bit about APEX, and I know some of you have been, well, all of you pretty much have been out and around, so we wanna be able to leave some time at the end if you guys have questions that you wanna ask about specifics. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Amy Stites, I'm one of the program educators. 
I'm Marion Holtorf. I'm one of the program educators. And I'm Megan Wilgenbush. I'm the chemical health specialist. And I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, just telling you kind of the nuts and bolts about our program. And then each of us will take part and share some of um, some more details about the students we have and the people we serve. We really were hoping to have one of our students or several of our students come to be able to share their, their story and their voice. Unfortunately, they're all busy, as you can imagine teenagers would be. So um, I guess, you know, we had a principal a couple years ago who had a vision um, of, and a goal of starting a sober school um, in response to what he was seeing. And, and it wasn't just at the ALC, it was really district wide. And we saw, he saw, uh, lots of kids using and abusing drugs and alcohol. And there really wasn't a response. And so before he <coughs> retired, he got this vision. And um, his name is Gordy Zebart. Most of you know him. He was quite the visionary. And um, he approached Marion and myself and said, what do you guys think about this? And would you guys be on board? And of course, we thought, sure, why not? Let's do it. Um, you know, one of our, our things at the ALC is to remove barriers. And we, too. <coughs> saw the need and decided, yep, this is what we're gonna do. So I guess it was about two and a half years ago, we decided to jump in. We spent some time um, working with several other sober schools in Minnesota, but we also visited and talked with people around the nation. And so our model is really based on um, a collaborative effort that we worked with, um, finding schools around the nation, just to kind of do things the way they were doing them, um, to begin with and then I think we've over the years put our own little creative spin on what we do and and actually we really don't there are some components that we model after um, some of the other schools but um, it, we do have a unique spin to what we do and I think one of the things that we are proud of as well is not only do we offer instructional um, services for our kids chemical health services but we are the only sober school in the nation that provides um, on-site mental health care so that's um, you know one of those things that really kind of stands out for all of us um, our mission really is to um, provide a sober school community and we focus on building that community in every way shape and form and just providing hope and support for our students because many times they come to us and you know they have overcome tremendous barriers and some of the things that they've experienced you and I would never want to have to deal with in our life and oftentimes they're hopeless and so we want to be able to provide a space where they know that we believe in them and we're going to give them the support that they need so that they can reestablish some hope and move into a pathway that takes them to graduation and beyond. Let me keep going. <laughs> we could talk all day about events. We love what we do. We have, we'll tell you we have the best jobs ever. Um, it's the best work we've ever done and the hardest work we've ever done, just because there's so many components that we're doing daily. Um, in addition to being teachers and counselor, chemical health, health counselor. Um, so basically our program is a year round program and that was uh, strategically planned that way because so many of our students are behind in credits when they come back to school or when they come to us and we wanted to give them every opportunity possible to get caught up. So we do require them to come to school in the summer and um, that's kind of presented some problems because as you can imagine, most kids don't want to go to school in the summer and a lot of kids want to work. So that was probably one of our bigger barriers to try and figure out how we can entice them and support them through a summer program. Um, we really, you know, I, I, we, we address their academic needs by um, looking, basically we build an individual learning plan for each student that comes to our program. We look at where the credits are, we look at what they need, and then we go to town to figure out how to do that. We do what's called a blended learning model, and so we do traditional classroom, um, teacher-led instruction, but we also have to rely on online learning, so we use Google Classroom. Um, we have some digital learning days, and um, we use Edgenuity, because as you know, there are like 19 mandatory classes that the kids have to take between 9th and 12th grade. We have 9th through 12th graders. So the two of us 
have to get very creative and um, very strategic in how we're going to address those 19 mandatory classes and then all the electives. So um, we, we reach out to our resources in the community quite a bit. Um, we have tapped into the Inside Out program at Mayo Clinic to do some of our science. Um, we actually haven't done that quite this year, but we're hoping to get it this spring. We worked with Whitewater DNR and the DNR um, last fall to do some of our sciences and um, just really taking the education model different from what is given at a mainstream school simply because our students didn't succeed in the mainstream. And so we can't do it exactly like they've that is the way it's been presented before. Um, trying to think what else, I need my glasses, sorry. <laughs> um, we do the student-centered um, focus on supporting their needs, um, both educational and chemical health. And really, we just, we, we love, we love our jobs. We love going to school and we really love our kids and we wanna do whatever we need to do to help them move towards graduation. Um, a lot of people ask why recovery school matters. And this is probably one of the things that, one of the messages we wanna share with not only you, but also the community. Because we know that we have a fabulous staff at ALC, fabulous teachers district-wide, and they're all doing similar things. They're connecting with kids and they're providing instruction and they're you know, going above and beyond, we know that. But why specifically does a recovery school matter? And we like to share um, a nationwide study that was done on sober schools. And the statistic is this. Students were two to four times more likely to remain sober when they attend a sober school. So I'm gonna have you put your parent hats on for a minute. <laughs> um, if you had a child that you have sent away to inpatient treatment and you paid 30, 40, 50,000 dollars each time he or she is sent away. You are going to do everything in your power to help him or her stay sober. And sending them right back to the mainstream school or his or her community school wherever he or she was attending is like asking, it's like asking somebody who, who uh, you say it, you, you're, you're better at it. <laughs> it's like asking a recovering alcoholic to go and sit in their bar for five to six hours a day next to their drinking buddies and not drink. And that's the reality that we have to face when we look nationwide is that drugs are an issue in every public high school and private high school across our nation. So when we can face that reality and say, this is what we're sending our child back to, this is what we're sending our students back to, how are we protecting that and how are we um, helping our child or our students find success as they re-enter back into their educational environment, we have to think differently about what that looks like. And I've probably talked way too long, so I'm gonna continue to pass it on to my teammates here. Um, I you. wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my role. So I'm a licensed alcohol drug counselor through the state of Minnesota, um, and I work with Apex. I do a chemical health group with the students, so we talk specifics about what they need help with. So it's usually coping skills, self-esteem, relapse prevention. I also do a one-on-one -on -one with them once a week where we get into more details about what their drug use history was, what they're struggling with, how we can get that help in the community, because as they were saying, environment, matters a lot with that recovery. Um, due to my own experiences, I'm very passionate about working with people in recovery. Um, I believe that every person and every teenager should know what it feels like to be happy, healthy, and sober. So being able to work with these adolescents and seeing them want to change, eager to learn, eager to try these new things and feel what it's like to be sober and doing those things that they never thought they could, like graduation, it's been a really awesome experience. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to be able to do since we couldn't have students come, they're all working or doing outpatient treatment or other life activities, um, is share a couple of um, bios that we had them write in conjunction with my English class and then chemical health group. Um, I first wanted to share some reflections that I had that had, have been really powerful for me as an educator um, and somebody who is passionate about working with at-risk youth. Um, I've been working with at-risk youth in some capacity for 18 years, and I thought when I took this job, it's like, oh yeah, I got this, this will be good. This is, I can do this, I know this gig. And what I found out is that I didn't know the gig. 
Um, and I am, I am deeply impacted by people in recovery in my life, um, but what I learned is that the student population is special. They are unique, even from other at-risk student populations that I've worked with before. Um, and the biggest piece that I have seen with this group is their trauma is off the charts. And I've, I've worked with the ALC um, in some capacity for 10 years. I've been a special ed teacher, an EBD teacher. I've worked with the county. The level of trauma that I've seen with these, these students that we work with every day with these students, um, it, it's unmanageable. We have had students who um, have found their parents died from an overdose. We've had students who have been sexually assaulted at young ages. Most of our female students have been sexually exploited in some capacity. And they began using drugs because they didn't know how to deal with that, like most 12-year-old girls would not. Um, and it became a really, unfortunately, effective strategy to use to not have to think about these things and feel these things. And so what we see then is they're getting sober and they come out of school, or they come to school, they come out of treatment, come to school, and all of these things that they've been working so hard to not have to feel and not have to face, they're coming out, and they're coming out in every direction. So we're the front lines to that, and we have to be, we always say, we have to be the calm in their life, we have to be the stable in their life, um, and we have to provide this community of what we are as a school and a family together so that they know that no matter what, we are gonna be there for them, we are gonna be consistent for them, and we are their school support, and we've got their backs. Uh, that, that was really powerful for me as I learned that the level of trauma that we have to work with um, and that we have to engage with these students. Another thing that's been really fun to see with this student population is they're incredibly bright. Mm -hmm. um, they are um, so creative, so intuitive, and they think outside the box. It's a cheesy way to say it, but they really do. And they want to be able to engage the world around them, um, but they have to do it in a different way because like many at-risk students, they're kind of disillusioned with school. And so um, when we can provide them opportunities, you know, they're very interested and passionate about issues of equity, um, issues of race and justice, um, politics. They are so into politics and I love it. <laughs> I teach social studies, so of course, you know. Um, but they, we just have to provide them the opportunities and we have to provide that pathway for them and just kind of sit back and watch them take off and watch their brains work and watch them feel confident in themselves again. So that's wonderful for us and we get to see, that's, we get, that's our front row seat, you know. We, that's, it's an honor for us to be able to see that. We, like she said, it's the hardest job and the best job we've had. Um, so with this in mind, you know, the biggest thing that I always keep in mind, even on the hardest days where I'm showing up and I'm tired and they're crazy because they're stuck inside in the winter like all the rest of the kids, is they bring their whole selves to us and they deserve every resource that we can give them. So with that in mind, we wanted you guys to be able to hear some student voices and um, we have a couple of bios that we wanted to be able to read and then if there is any time for questions, we'd love to take questions. We like questions. Uh, so the first bio is from one of our female students who is 17 years old and now on track for graduation. Um, so I've always dreamt about walking at graduation and for a while it was hard to see that happening. When I was little I was surrounded by addiction. It seemed like everywhere I looked there were bad things happening. I grew up in Long Beach, California for the most part. When I was seven I moved to Minnesota with my parents and my sister. I got bullied, hated school, but hated being at home even more. My dad overdo overdosed and aspirated on his vomit. A lack of oxygen to the brain left him in a coma. When he woke up from his coma six days later, he had a brain injury and had to learn how to eat, talk, walk, and just live all over again. My mom moved us back to California when he was still in the hospital, and my sister and I hated her for it. So right when I turned old enough to choose where I wanted to live, I chose to live with my dad. It turned out my dad wasn't doing as good as I thought he was. I started smoking weed and drinking alcohol when I was 12. I would go to parties almost every night. Then two years later, I was still doing the same thing, except when I would get tired, I would snort a line of meth so I could continue partying. I didn't start using meth daily until I was 15. After that, I stopped going to school and was running away so much. My life became so unmanageable and I knew I needed help, but I didn't want to reach out. In October of 2017, I ran away and was gone for four months. When I was found, I went to Harbor Shelter in Hastings, Minnesota and got placed in my aunt's care until I could go to treatment on March 8th. In treatment, I found out I was getting put into foster care. I was so scared. My aunt got her foster license so I could just go home. I got out of treatment and thought I was set and cured, but I soon realized that's not how that works at all. 
I started going to Apex Recovery School, but I was using the whole time and got kicked out and had to get better before I was accepted back. I stayed doing the same stuff until I was forced into detox. I was there for seven days, and then I went to a group home for nine days waiting for a bed to open up in treatment. When I finally got to treatment, I loved it and the people. It opened my eyes so much and matured me. I was there for 99 days, and when I got out, I wanted things to be different for me. I met a girl in treatment, and she needed a foster home, so me and my aunt were able to open our home up to her, and it was a huge blessing. I now go to meetings and work a program. I'm six months sober and counting. This is the best I've ever done in my life, and I'm so thankful for my journey. It has taught me how to be strong and brave. I am back at Apex, and my graduation is finally in sight. So one more story for you also from one of our female students who's 17. It's weird for me to be asked to tell you about myself because no one has ever cared to hear my story before. I grew up in a home where my dad was never around, and when he was, he was drunk or high. He was violent and broke things. I remember, remember being terrified of what I called his monster voice whenever he got angry. Getting older, my mom was struggling with her own past, and she began projecting her past abuse onto me. Though my mom provided us with the physical aspects of life, I always felt that I raised my little sister. When my mom wasn't acting like a parent, my sister used to call me mommy and I reciprocated with baby. Growing up in an abusive home, I always felt like I was walking on broken glass that had been crudely covered by a thin rug. I'd like to say that I used to be terrified of saying or doing the wrong thing, but I know that I still am. I have struggled with anxiety and depression most of my life. Because of the way I was raised, everything I did became a part of a mechanized survival tactic. Everything I said to my family was always calculated to cause the least amount of retaliation as possible, though I quickly learned that doing everything you can is not always enough. I felt worthless and had no one to talk to about what was going on. When I was 12, I started drowning my pain by taking anything I could find. I would drink a bottle of cough syrup or take many pills at a time of anything I could find. I would cut myself and then blame it on my cat or say I ran into something. My mom would tell me she didn't want me or that I made her want to kill herself and um, then tell everyone that I had imagined it. After years of hearing that everything was only in my head, I couldn't trust anyone around me, including myself. I questioned everything. I, he, I question everything I hear, think, or experience. I learned to be quiet and isolate myself in my own <clears throat> cage of fears and resentments. Going to treatment was devastating for me. Everything I had taught myself in order to be safe was wrong. They were ripping out my hardwired defense mechanisms, and I felt that I had no control over anything as the walls were quick, quickly crumbling down on me. When I got to Apex, I was in shock because it was not structured like any other school I have been to. They understand when you're struggling and help us find a way to succeed. I finally feel like I belong somewhere where others understand my struggles and can relate. I have people I can depend on and that can depend on me. When I first decided to be sober, it was for other people's comfort. I didn't want to let them down. It was a weight on my shoulders that I was struggling to bear. One day I realized the weight wasn't as heavy, and it was because I had finally become sober for myself and no one else. Looking back, I know that there's damage to myself and to others that cannot be undone. It will always be there. The difference is this time that I've been given the tools to rebuild one brick at a time. Any comments from uh, members of the board? Any Just a quick question. How did you come up with uh, Apex? name funny you should ask um <laughs> so when i taught at john adams jim sanyo had an apex group it was the top tier for response to intervention kids who were struggling and he always talked about apex reaching their peak and this group the work he did with this group um they turned around i mean they turned around their behavior they turned around their academics and he always talked about reaching their peak and so when we started to put together the idea of apex we first asked the kids what they want. They didn't want to be called recovery or sober school. They the first name for our school was recovery, recovery school, school at ALC. And mm -hmm. they didn't want to be associated with that. They wanted something else. So we let them come up with ideas. And they were coming up with like day bridge and horizons. And we're like, well, these don't really sound like daycare sleep. centers or nursing homes. Yeah. That's what they sound like. <laughs> so we, we talked about Apex. We pitched it out to them and, and they liked it. And then Marion 
had their English class work with it. And yeah, actually, it. we um, we try and do as much project-based learning as we can, and this was a perfect opportunity because they were so encouraged and enthusiastic. We're going to change the name of this school, and so um, I said, "All right, you're going to pitch this, and you're going to write a speech, um, and you're going to work together on how you time it, and then you're going to present this to our admin team and see if they go for it. They might go for it, they might not, and they did. The only request that they had was that I be there and I press play on the soundtrack of Chariots of Fire. <laughs> that happened, true story. true story. They felt that it was really an important part of that speech. So, yeah. So, well, other questions? Um, so, you have how many students and how many can you accommodate? Great sure. question. Um, our enrollment really fluctuates between like seven, eight, nine, and last spring we ended up with, with 17. Um, Mr. Zebart thought we could have up to 30 and at 17 last year when you're building individual learning plans for each student it's two pretty, teachers 19 classes <laughs> yeah. few electives right um, yeah so you know yes we could take up to 30 um, I think I think um, people support more like 17 17 <laughs> it's probably yeah thank you yeah director workman um, I have such mixed reactions to the stories that you just read. Um, it's heartbreaking. It is. But then I see you here, and I'm mentally seeing your colleagues, and that gives me hope. And I want to thank you for that. And please thank your students for sharing their stories with us, because that is really... Uh, your enthusiasm and your dedication, but hearing it from, from their own voices is, is really important. So I, I know sometimes it's difficult for them to do it, but tell them thank you for us. You absolutely will. Thank you. And I just wanted to express uh, it is important for um, the citizenry of Rochester to, to hear you know, this wonderful story. I um, commend the vision of, of Gordy and then the support of the superintendent to allow that uh, vision to come to fruition. Uh, but also as I listen to the um, professional skill sets you have, I commend you as well for your willingness to not just focus in a specialty area, but to acquire whatever skills are necessary to, to serve the kids. And, and so I do have a question to um, Megan, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there probably are students in our other high schools who may struggle with uh, drug or alcohol addiction or usage. Uh, are you ever able to do any outreach or how does the word get out to them? So right now I meet with the day school kids, night school kids for um, the ALC as well as our Apex kids and the Apex kids keep me pretty busy. <laughs> um, it's It's been Awesome, though, seeing them want to be so open with me and coming to me when they are struggling or need to find that support. So um, I haven't done a lot of outreach with the other schools. I've talked a little bit with the LADC at John Marshall, um, but there's definitely a need for more LADCs in the schools, and I know that I have a feeling that that's going to be something that's going to come in the future. Uh, thank you, and thank you for putting on your event a few months ago. It was. It was a lovely event and um, a fabulous speaker. And I think, um, you know, some of us were able to be there, but seeing the other community members there, I think, was really, really important um, because all of us in our education world yeah. kind of sort of get it, maybe know about it, um, about all of our different kinds of students. So, really appreciate that. Um, I am going to steal a little something from Superintendent that he said last night when we were talking about TV, right? And you don't have to answer this now. But think about what can we do for you? What can this board do to support you? What can administration do to support you? Um, and again, like Jean says, you die of humble. And I know you like to go off to your southern corner of, <laughs> of, the, of you know, our district and kind of lay low, but uh, you get the spotlight shined on you and you all kind of you know, say, oh, shucks. But really, you know, honestly, let us know what, what we can do and what the community can do to help you because we, you've you got a heavy load and you're doing a lot of work and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Director you Edmondson. 
Uh, I was going to say almost exactly what Director Sulinger said, but um, specifically for those people, because as we all know, resources are limited and, and we do the best we can do, but um, there might be a lot of people listening. And if you have a wish list, if, if, you, if you wanted to put it out there into the world, what, what do you need? What's your wish list? It's a dangerous question. <laughs> volunteers, <laughs> supplies, something that uh, community partners could help you with. The first thing Consider that comes this to a free commercial. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> um, I, really, the only thing that comes to my mind is actually not even for our program. I think about, you know, I've got children in Rochester Public Schools, um, and of course, from my lens, I'm talking to them about this already, and they're young, they're elementary age. Mm -hmm. um, but our hearts and minds are, they often go to our elementary, older elementary students um, and our middle school students. You heard that both of these students began using when they were 12 and that age typically shocks people because um, they think like, oh, maybe seventh grade, maybe eighth grade. Um, right. Most students who are going to struggle with deep addiction are going to start using by around 12. That's what we're seeing in, in the area. Um, sometimes 11, sometimes 13, but it's just a short window of time that really matters. And so when I'm thinking about it's not for our program, but I would love to not be necessary, to not have a job, really. You know, that's that would be a good, good goal for us. Um, but if that's going to be realistic at all, then I think as a, as a community, I would love for us to start looking at younger our younger students and what we can do for them and just start talking you know there's so much shame around mm -hmm. this uh, this topic and we see that daily we see it in our parent communications or you know even with talking with our kids and even just talking with community members there's so much shame and people don't want to talk about it we have to talk about it it's killing people it's killing kids so. again thank you very much thank you thank you so much 3.03, .03, above and beyond, Mr. Munoz. All right, we have a short list uh, for the month of January. <laughs> So it wasn't hard for me to pick two samples to read to you. But anyway, uh, Cindy and Alexandra were the nominated for the month of January. I'll start off with Alexandria. Uh, Edison E.L. Bilinguals. Alex consistently goes above and beyond to reach families. She will take her own time to make sure she has connected with them and is always willing to continue to pursue families even when communication is difficult. She is such an asset to the bilingual team and our schools, but especially to our families. Thank you for removing barriers, Alex, and for never giving up. And then we have Cindy. I would like to recognize Cindy for her exceptional work with specialized transportation. She is so efficient and follow through with every email and request. Her responses are quick and always helpful. She deals with outside agencies and works to help solve problems. Thank you, Cindy. So congratulations to both Cindy and Alexandria. And we don't have a drawing this time. Next. Thank you. Next. School board committee assignment updates. Uh, are there any updates, any directors? Uh, Shalis Mayor. Just like to say we've had our, as we'll see, a few agenda items tonight. Uh, the, I believe the final facilities task force where it's come to fruition and we'll have an update and a recommendation on where we proceed from here later tonight. But I really wanted to thank, of course, the community members who helped to shape hopefully where we're going with the future of the facilities and especially the consultants that we hired. You know, again, we talked about it. It was a lot of money, but they really did a great, great job for the school district. And I don't think we could get to where we are with tonight's recommendations without them in a timely and cost-effective manner. Thank you. Other updates? And we, uh, we plan to bring them at a future meeting and thank them <laughs> for committing their time and helping us with this. So we'll, we'll get them here in the near future. Director Workman. I have several events. Do you want them all at once? Uh, okay. Yes, please. So the first one I attended, there's not really a report and it's not a committee, was the eggs and issues. 
on February 22nd, uh, put on by the Chamber of Commerce, and the speaker was Myron Franz, who is the Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and he was trying to give us an idea of what the budget might be. However, the governor's release came out about a week later, and it, there, there were some differences there. So, uh, Director Nathan was with me. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, it was a spirited discussion, as some of our local legislators were also there and had questions for the commissioner um, about various initiatives. And then it, there was an opportunity for members of the audience to question them. Um, not much said because it's still early in the legislative session, but a great opportunity to hear uh, from the people who are managing the numbers and making the decisions uh, early on in this legislative process. Uh, my next event, um, and this is one of my committee assignments, was the Association of Metropolitan School Di Districts, and this was this past Friday. And um, it was really interesting at the end, there was a discussion of e-learning days by three superintendents um, from the metro area. And I'm certainly not recommending that we pursue any of these, but it was interesting as to how they were trying to incorporate meaningful work with technology, with teachers being available, and to somehow make it a really productive day for students. Uh, one of the districts does have one-to-one -one, uh, computers or iPads or something like that, which makes it certainly a whole lot easier when you know that your students have access to the internet. But they also had, uh, one district also had some different um, arrangements whereby if the students didn't, weren't able to get that done on the snow day, they could just get it done at, at some other point so that the, the, that learning continued. Um, and once again, I'm not making a recommendation one way or another as to how we might or might not proceed with such a thing. And then the last event I went to was on Monday and Director Amundsen was with me to the government forums also put on by the Chamber of Commerce. And um, Superintendent Munoz was there, and there was quite an interesting discussion concerning tobacco use and particularly vaping. And the proposal for, uh, from the Olmsted um, <coughs> County Commissioners that Olmsted County go tobacco, um, to tobacco 21, thank you. And I, I misunderstood at first as to what this was. It was that you would not be able to buy these products until you're 21. So. You know, we have a lot of students who are 18, and they're able to get these devices very readily. And um, Mike, I really appreciated the passion that you brought to it <laughs> as to what an important, yeah, yeah. <laughs> an important issue this is. And once again, I think it's just raising awareness because when I went to high school back in the dinosaur days, we didn't have these issues at all. And I think like the presentation that we just had, it's really important to understand what kids are actually facing in our schools these days. Um, so that, that was pretty much the major thing on that. Did you have I anything you'd like to add? Everything you said. Okay. Good. 7.30 in the morning is not my optimal time. but. So last Thursday we had a meeting of the Rochester PTSA Area Council and Director Seelinger was there, as was the superintendent and uh, John Carlson from our finance department. And uh, Mr. Carlson gave a great presentation about um, uh, information about where we were with uh, enrollment and finances. And um, it's a great opportunity to, for our PTA leadership to hear um, some of the information that goes into district decision making. So this is my commercial for our PTA leadership. Um, we have a few more meetings left in the year and we're going to have some visitors from the cabinet um, to come to those meetings as well um, as are any PTA members uh, welcome to attend. Yeah, just a, a couple things uh, that uh, Julie mentioned. Uh, the first one uh, addressing E-days and, and things like that. We did uh, this week at Meet Confer have uh, a conversation with REA and, and we are going to work together and uh, looking at w how could we build in, uh, you know, makeup days, do we look at e-learning days uh, and try to get them in place for next school year. 
as soon as possible so parents can know that if we get to a point where we have a bunch of snow days, um, we know this is your first makeup day or we're going to use e-learning. Uh, we've actually discussed e-learning quite a bit at our big nine superintendent meetings and one of the things that we always struggle with is how about those students that don't have access to internet and and what do you do with them and it sounds like uh, some schools just allow them to make it up uh, later when they get back to school and I'm I don't know where I honestly where I stand on e-learning days uh, I'm not a real big supporter to brag that I have e-learning days and it's just busy work because I'm not into just doing busy work and if we can really connect it to uh, what we're doing uh, in school then I think I would be open to that but we are going to have those conversations with meet and confer and uh, you know is it e-learning or is it uh, building makeup days or a combination of the two right now the statute allows uh, districts to count up to five e-learning days in a, in a school year uh, so we'll we'll start having those conversations and and uh, probably eventually come back to the board with um, permission to put those on next um, year's calendar we also had a really brief, brief conversation do we need to look at uh, doing something yet this year if we have any more snow days we're up to nine um, so we're, we're gonna have a smaller subgroup quickly get together and, and have those conversations uh, a lot depends uh, Senator Nelson uh, introduced a bill a week ago uh, tomorrow uh, which would give local school boards the authority to uh, for this year only to reduce reduce your calendar days without uh, facing any kind of penalty so if that bill happens to go through then uh, we would probably be okay for this year um, and then the other um, agenda item um, <clears throat> we did have a thank you for calling it passionate discussion <laughs> Uh, it was a topic that kind of woke me up. It was, you know, 7.30 in the morning, so kind of, what is So anyway, um, I am actually working with some individuals at Mayo Clinic and, and uh, actually will be joining them when this is discussed with the county commissioners and will, I don't know if you want to call it, provide testimony, but really have an opportunity during our public comment to uh, just share a little bit of some of the concerns we have at the district with uh, with vaping specifically and the rationale behind making you be 21 to purchase is that we we believe that our ninth through 12th graders probably don't have a lot of connections with 21 year olds but they do we have 18 year olds in our schools and they can easily buy and then turn around and sell them to students in the school so uh, I think that's sometime uh, late March uh, is when uh, I will be doing that uh, with the county commissioners. Thank you. And um, the board as a whole, we have received uh, both uh, as an email and then in terms of um, conversation while we're out and about uh, questions regarding will days have to be made up. And so could you just perhaps expound upon that just a tad bit more? Yeah, at this time, uh, we, we aren't planning to do that. Um, you know if we continue to have a few more then I think we're gonna to have to have a serious conversation about that and that's kind of what we discussed at meet and conferred that uh, you know we still have probably a really good month of potential snow weather so uh, that's why we want to try to have a, a, a plan if that happens and um, but right now at this time we're if we don't have any more which we hope uh, um, we don't plan to make those up okay. thank you I'd, I'd like to add on to that just a little bit in that I'm, I know there are, are parents out there who are genuinely concerned as are we in terms of the students in education being interrupted um, but at the same time I'd also like to point out that not all educational learning happens within the classroom and that these students may be learning some very good life skills such as how to shovel without having a heart attack and those kinds of things on these days that, that they're home. So um, please consider that as well. Thank you. Consent agenda. Does anyone want any item removed for separate consideration? Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Munoz. Yes, we have uh, three retirements that we would like to recognize. First one is Christina Dahl. She's a teacher for the deaf and hard of hearing at for the district. 
district-wide. Her retirement is effective at the end of the day, June 3rd, 2019, and she's been with the district 31 years. Uh, the next one is Deborah DeYoung. She's a science teacher at Mail High School. Her retirement is effective at the end of the day, June 3rd, 2019, and she's been with the district 28 years. And then a paraprofessional retirement, Melissa Christensen, elementary paraprofessional at Bishop Elementary. Her retirement is effective May 31st, 2019, and she's been with the district eight years. So we would like to thank those three individuals for their service to our students and our families and to our district. Thank you. Project search update, Mr. Munoz. Yes, I've been waiting for this, and I'm sorry we made you guys wait so long, but come on up, come on up. All right, Chaz, are you going first? You're my buddy now. We're, we're, pretty, we're pretty tight here, so are you going first or is somebody else going? You are? All right. <clears throat> Project Search is an employer-driven transition-to-work model that was developed in Cincinnati Children's Hospital in 1996. It has grown from a single program site to a large, expanding international network of sites in almost 600 locations in 45 states and 10 countries, with a site in New Zealand being added in January. Project Search started at the Mayo Clinic in 2015 and is currently in its fourth year and is one of eight sites, soon to be nine, in Minnesota. Mayo Clinic Project Search is a program for students 18 to 21 years old who qualify for support services in the Rochester Public Schools. It is a partnership between the Mayo Clinic and the school district where students participate in three 10-week unpaid internship rotations in different Mayo Clinic departments, both on the downtown campus and off-site locations. The goal of Project Search is to gain work experience and learn skills to be competitively employed. Just, just before, you and I need to work together because how you did that without looking at your paper, <laughs> you need to help me with that skill. <laughs> nice job. We are the only seven students in the Rochester Public Schools who can say our classroom is the Mayo Clinic. We started the year with four weeks of orientation. In four weeks, we learned how to navigate the downtown campus on both the subway and the street level. This was not an easy task, as internship sites are from one end of the campus to the other in 11 of 18 buildings. When they said we needed comfortable shoes, they weren't kidding. <laughs> We welcome speakers from dre for various roles at the Mayo Clinic to give us advice on dress and decorum, resumes, and interview skills. We completed over 23 Mayo Clinic learning modules covering topics such as Mayo Clinic history, core values, and mission, safety training, confidentiality, and HIPAA, and site-specific trainings. At the end of the first four weeks, we felt excited and better prepared to start our first internships. We are responsible for our own transportation to and from the Mayo Clinic. Our day starts at 7.30 in the classroom where we build fundamental job skills, workplace communication, uh, and personal skills. From 9 to 2.30, we are responsible in our internship sites. This is where we spend the majority of our day. We work side by side with our teams, learning remarkable work skills and behaviors in real life situations. At two thirty, we return to the classroom to discuss our day, problem solving journal. Our day ends at three o'clock. My name is August Williams. Uh, uh, my first rotation was at Compare Medicine, Compare at, in Guggenheim and St Stabile Buildings. Compare Medicine supports Mayo Clinic investigators in animal research to a highly regulated and controlled environment. Re interns receive additional training and learn protocols to follow the IACUC and rules regulations. IACUC stands for the International Animal Care and Use Committee. In animal in compare medicine, we fill water bottles, mop and sweep, holding rooms, stock and invest investigator cards, with supplies. 
load sleds and operate the autoclave, work in the cage wash, and, and provide abridgments. <coughs> Another one of our partners is support, I media mean, support services. This internship is split between two sites, the print shop at Tackenley Drive Warehouse and downtown at Osmond East. At Osmond East, we work with Excel and spreadsheets. We track description emails to improve department practices, track warehouse recycling, categorized, mail, clinic form, and complete supply inventory. At the print shop, we complete mail looks up, look up to sort and route mail to employees. A lot of mail is arrived, addressed by name, no department or location, it's like where's Waldo? <laughs> but it's where it's John Smith. We also assemble DVDs for patients and employee education and work in boundary making booklets by operating an industrial stapler that looks like a large stapler. My second rotation is at DLMP. My third rotation will be at environmental <coughs> services. I am different since I started prior research. I used I use kinder words when talking to people when I'm le I'm learning to be less offensive and I'm proud of my fellow interns telling me that I am more respond respectful, feedback be positive. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Parker Lichtemalter. Environmental Services is the face of Mayo Clinic. Um, yep, four, yep. I spent my first rotation covering over 260,000 square feet of area in, in the subway and lobby levels of the Mayo, Gonda, and Plumber buildings. In those areas, we disinfect phones, handrails, drinking fountains, and waste receptacles. We also clean the glass of the Plumber and Mayo entrances, along with the curved glass of the Gonda building, using a special tooth cloth method. A new area this year, which location is actually top secret, <laughs> is the River Room, a special break room for the doctors and voting staff of Mayo Clinic. We, we are cleaning the bathrooms for the first time as Environmental Services looks to expand our training opportunities and responsibilities. My second rotation is in Central Services at Eisenberg. We deliver plastics to nursing units throughout the hospital on the third through ten floors. Using a large delivery cart, we wrap instrumental trays for the Gonda ENT, nose, throat, and, yep, and ears. Wrap light handles used for dermatology procedure rooms. Assemble peel pouches containing nasal speculums, tongue blades, otoscopes, and ear speculums. And bag surgical equipment like head covers, hypoclense bottles, stomach tubes, and catheter tips. My third rotation will be in DLMP. Project Search has changed me into a person who takes action and recognizes what needs to be done. It has helped me become less defensive and more willing to be a team player. My name is Chaz Morris. My first rotation was at the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology located at St. Peter Drive. DLMP is one of the largest and most high-tech clinical laboratory and pathology departments in the world. It processes more than 40,000 specimens that arrive from around the globe every day. Our tasks include water spartering, where we pick up specimens from the lab techs and deliver them to the correct processing area. We pluck test tubes by placing them on an automated conveyor belt to be processed. Specimens that can't be plucked need to be manually sorted and then scanned into the computer, which is called racking. DLMP will be introducing a one-of-a-kind automated sorting system to take the place of manual sorting, which interns are excited to be part of. My second rotation is in environmental services, and my third rotation will be in comparative medicine. I have 
matured and become more of a professional young adult since starting Project Search, gaining more confidence to do more than what I thought I could do. I have learned not to make excuses, to ask more questions. I am anxious to learn, and I am a more positive person. My name is Stephanie Kaiser. My first rotation was in Human Resources, which is located in the Osmond East Building. Mayo Clinic employs more than 34,000 people at the main campus, and therefore, confidentiality is important. In HR, we are responsible for ordering background checks for new hires and shredding confidential papers for current and past employees. We deliver mail to floors one through four in the Osmond East Building. Send out end of the month reminders to sponsors of trainees. Put nursing packets together for recruitment and replace watch batteries for recruitment at career fairs. My second rotation is in comparative medicine and my third rotation will be in pediatrics. My name is Josh Baffert. My first rotation was in food service which is located in the Eisenberg building on the Methodist campus. Mayo Clinic believes in the power of food and our food is prepared fresh in a large industrial kitchen which this year has been under construction. In the patient visitor cafe, we need to know the daily menu items and proper plating techniques. When we were in the ingredient room, we washed boxes of boxes of grapes and prepared large sheets of bacon. We packaged individual servings of fruit, gel, and eggs for retail sale in the cold food prep area. Co food service is a very busy and chaotic place. Our second rotation is in health science research. Health science research is located on the fifth floor of the BioBusiness Center. We use multiple computer programs for confidential cancer research. We enter, we enter data from patient surveys for colon cancer studies, archived over 200,000 blood spot samples, 206, 400 to be exact, review and scan death certificates, and prepare patient consent forms for a breast cancer study. My third rotation will be in Central Services at St. Mary's. I have a more positive attitude since being in Project Search. The quality of my work has improved, and I've become more calm and focused. I am happy. Pediatrics is located on the 16th floor of the mail building it is, and is very busy serving infants, toddlers, and adolescents. Tasks in this rotation include delivering mail to secretaries and nursing stations, along with picking up prescriptions and notes and delivering to designated secretaries for processing. Interns also dust, carpet sweep, and straighten the waiting area and patient education center. Patient rooms are checked and restocked with exam supplies, such as culture swabs, ear credits, tongue depressors, band-aids, and even coloring sheets and colors for the patients. Since starting Project Search, I am more confident and give detailed answers to questions. I'm finding my voice. I've learned to give my opinion more rather than letting others talk for me. My name is Piron. My first rotation was in Central Services, located in the basement level of St. Mary's. Central Services, where hospital equipment is sterilized, used for patient rooms, doctor's offices, and surgical rooms. Interns unload surgical instruments, plastics, and commodes from washers. We also peg stethoscopes and call buttons. We deliver hospital clean items to hospital floors when needed. My second rotation is in Charter House. Charter House is a residential facility. Interns are responsible to keep 12 <coughs> common areas and two entryways clean from the first floor to the 22nd floor. Some areas we dust, vacuum, include the dining room, Higgins Library, Parkside Gallery, craft room, fitness center. We also make sure the hallways are clean, consistent living. We really enjoy being around residents, house residents. My third rotation will be in linen services. Project search has changed me a more confident get to know new people, ask more questions, talk more, share ideas more, learn to get the job done right than just doing it. I am Blake Smith. My first rotation it was at Land Services, located in the 3939 building. It's a 72,000 square foot warehouse. 
as a central location for the processing and distribution of linen for the mill. In case of disaster, it also houses eight days of emergency linens for all of the mill clinic health systems throughout the Midwest. We count and restock a variety of surgical and patient linen carts uh, with scrub pants, flat sheets, towels, pillowcases, washcloths, and blankets. Being Meeting the needs of patients requires a lot of linen. My second rotation is at Central Services at St. Mary's, and my third rotation will be at May Support Services at Print Shop. Project Search has helped me be more focused, more social, and I'm learning to speak up more. I have a more positive and respectful attitude towards all my team members. The sole, def the sole definition of a successful outcome in Project Search is competitive employment for each intern. Competitive employment is defined as 16 hours a week or more, minimum wage or above, non-seasonal, and in an integrated setting working alongside coworkers with and without disabilities. Nationally, 70.2% of interns completing Project Search gain competitive employment. Since 2015, 23 interns have completed Mayo Clinic Project Search. Of those 23, each graduate obtained competitive employment. Five were hired at the Mayo Clinic, four with a Mayo Clinic contractor, and 14 with community employers. These are 23 young adults who would, who would not be employed if, in their current positions had it not been for Project Search. We are proud to have received the we the one hundred employment the one hundred percent employment award at the national conference for the first two years of the program. Every year the <laughs> every year the project search interns decide on a theme. It is unique to each group. At match day back in August, we were told DDHD. Dreams don't have deadlines. That got us thinking. Then in December, the Cairns Burns documentary about the Mayo Clinic talked about the dream Mother Alfred Mose had about building St. Mary's after the tornado. It seemed that dream was meant to be part of our theme. As young adults with disabilities, it is not always easy to dream we are held back by what others think are our limitations. Project Search has given us the opportunity to look beyond the ordinary or expected. It has opened our eyes to the future. Our theme for 2018-2019 Project Search is Dream, Imagine, Believe. Thank you for supporting this program that allows us to dream big, imagine the possibilities, and believe great things can happen. Thank you. If we could have the Rochester Public School employees that are part of this uh, program, if you could stand and be recognized. <laughs> and then, um, I know I've seen a few of the Mayo Clinic people that are part of this program. If you could also stand to be recognized. And another important group, parents of these uh, students, if you could stand and be recognized. I think I got everybody, but uh, the last thing, I, th I'm going to be honest, this is, we have awesome partnerships in our community, but this is my favorite. This is awesome. <laughs> and it, it just, I look forward to you guys coming every year because I, I'm fortunate enough to be there the day that you find out what your first assignment is. So I get to interact with you at the beginning. I can interact with you at midway through to see the growth that you've made, and then I'm fortunate to see you at your graduation as well. So nice job, great presentation. You and I need to touch base on how you did that because I need some help <laughs> with that. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. Director Marvin. 
First of all, your presentations were amazing. Uh, the, the delivery, you guys could all be on showbiz. And, you know, you'll be online so you can watch yourselves. We, I saw a lot of parents back there trying to tape the thing. It's already taped. Yeah. <laughs> so watch it repeatedly. But that was amazing. And Mayo is a better place because you're there. Uh, so good for you. Keep doing the work. Question. Do, are any of you doing anything that you're thinking, I want to keep doing this forever, or doing something where you've learned, I'm not so much into this job? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> The, your bosses are sitting back. Then. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk later. Anyway, that was fantastic. Thank you. So, were you guys nervous? Yes. 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 Yeah. I, I'm always nervous when I have to present to the board, too. But did you know that you can take your little name tags home as a memento of, of look what I did? Because you guys are really proud of yourselves. I'm, I'm really impressed with all of you. And if this is an example of how our students can meet the graduate profile components, um, this is a model for all of our education across Rochester Public Schools, what you guys do. You really show what it is to be a graduate and a successful graduate. So thank you for being here. Thank you for all your work and thank you for your smiles. Um, it was great to have you here tonight. Thank you. And at this point, the chair is going to entertain a five-minute recess. Uh, our agenda gets rather heavy beyond this point, so five-minute recess. Reconvening our school board meeting at 6.59. 502, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time, I'm going to have Kevin Holmes, uh, LHB, and his team, and Sue from uh, School Perceptions, to, and our two co-chairs. To, Mark thought he can get out of it, but no, we're going to have the co-chairs come up as well and, and share the results of the survey. present the findings of the survey for uh, information tonight. Uh, we're hoping that you folks will be able to make a decision on a um, on the question for the ballot in two weeks, if not in two weeks, in four weeks. And then our goal is to finalize the review and comment and submit that to uh, Department of Education by middle of May. Uh, they take about 60 days to review, um, and or they can take up to 60 days to review. Uh, we have had some conversations with them already, and they seem favorable to the um, the approach that we've been going. So that's that's all the good news. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Sue. All right. At long last, let's take a look at what your survey data looks like. Um, as you're aware, the survey was conducted in February of this year. All residents within the district were mailed that paper survey that had that one-time use access code on it to ensure data integrity. You had 8,243 folks within the district that responded to the survey. And of those, 2731 sent a, back a pen and paper um, survey to our home office in Slinger, Wisconsin, near Milwaukee. So a 14% response rate. Absolutely excellent response rate. Remember, the survey had two purposes. One was to educate, the second was to gather data. As we move through, you can assume a 1.1 margin of error. So as you recall, when I talked about how we do this survey, we gather data on who took the survey. This allows us to slice and dice your data for a variety of purposes. One is to give you, with some degree of, a high degree of predictability, what happens at the polls. But also, as you make some other decisions, you can say, mm, what did this group say, what did that group say? Now why isn't my clicker working? 
There we go. What is your age? So we wanted to make sure that all age groups of the serve of your community were represented. As you can see here, they are. We're most interested in those friends over the age of 56, and specifically those over the age of 65. Um, we know that U.S. Census data tells us in a typical community, 16% of the residents are over the age of 65. So we always want to make sure that that 65 and older is that at least 16%, slightly overrepresented, but that's okay because what do we know about folks over the age of 65? Where do they show up? Oh. At the polls, exactly. We asked folks to, if they lived within the school district, uh, we'll remove non-resident respondents. So 95% of those who took the survey said, yep, I live within the district. 4% were no. You're saying, who would those folks be? Remember, all staff had the opportunity to respond to the survey as well as all parents. So you likely have employees that work for you that don't live in the district as well as boundary in parents, and 1% weren't sure we'll remove those folks as well. Where should I be pointing this? <laughs> the mystery. Kevin, it's running through you. That's the problem. <laughs> we want to know the municipality. 83% of those lived within the city of Rochester. You'll see small percentages of your other municipalities there. Again, an opportunity when you look at the data, you'll have access. I'll talk about that in a little bit, that you can go in and look at all of those. It's coming through you. Oh, you're pointing that. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. All right. We wanted to know um, what area. Remember, we separated your district into quadrants. 42% were in the northwest quadrant, 19% northeast, 17% southeast, 22% in the southwest. Um, we asked if you were an employee of the district, 19% of the survey respondents work for you. This is important because we know what? Your employees have a critical voice in the community. They actually make up less than 1% of folks at the polls. So you'll see as I move through their responses, um, their, their impact on what happens at the polls from a voting stance is very low. But the message they have to your citizens is extremely high. So they're having those critical conversations each and every day. So it's important that we know what they are thinking. All right, you might have to go over. Can we click it? Oh, do you have children attending school in the district? 46% of the survey respondents were parents. Parents make up about 25% of folks at the polls. So as we move through the data, I want you to think 25% weighting towards parents. 75% will be a group that I'm going to continually talk about as a non-parent, non-staff. I don't work for the district. I don't have kids in the district. So I'm less connected, OK? Uh, we asked if you had school-aged children, what grade range? Obviously, folks could check more than one if I've got kids in multiple buildings, but you'll be able to use this data as you go in and disaggregate. We asked one question regarding communication. This allows us to say, how is it that your citizens want to hear what's happening in the district? This is the first time I've started to pull your data <coughs> apart. So here we look at non-parent, non-staff, and then your parents that don't work for the district. Obviously, we know that it's easy for us to connect with your staff. But as you can see here, your general citizens look to the TV news coverage and to the Rochester Post Bulletin. So obviously, connecting with your media partners is critical for getting your message out. I'll tell you, we do this survey, uh, you know, hundreds of times a year. Those are high percentages. So uh, again, that partnership with those media partners is really important. But your parents are saying, nope, send me a text message. I'm connecting with you on social media. Um, and I go to your district website. We asked folks, okay, if you um, utilize social media, how are you connected with the district? Obviously, you can see here that Facebook is the primary way that parents are getting information. A small percentage are on Twitter, and just 2% of your parents are on YouTube, and a very small percentage of your general citizens are connected. So perhaps an opportunity as you move, if you choose to move to uh, going to a referendum, looking at ways to increase that following <laughs> of your general citizens on social media. This is like a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> a bad
battery issue? Okay. <laughs> Every time you move, it works. All right, so remember <laughs> that uh, there were two purposes. That one was to educate, so we wanted to let folks know that we had enrollment growth in the district. Yeah, you're going to have to go stand over there, I think. <laughs> what do you think it is, Heather? Enrollment growth, and then we had school capacity challenges. You had safety and security needs that needed to be addressed, as well as outdated support spaces. Click four through, I think. Can you just hit it? Yep, keep going, keep yeah. going. So we said, all right, given all of this information, what advice is it that you would give the school board? As we can see here, 69% of all survey respondents said, they're giving you a nod that they do support the idea of going out for a bond referendum. Again, we've separated this data into three mutually exclusive groups. Why do we do that? Because we know if we just looked at all survey respondents, it's overrepresented of your staff and parents, okay? So too many staff and parents took the survey if we're looking at a representative sample of what happens at the polls. We've got an 80% support nod from your employees who are residents of the district. That's great. Remember, those are those critical conversations. 75% of your parents are saying, yep, this is something we need. They're your customers. But we're most interested in those purple friends, that non-parent, non-staff group. And so the fact that we have over a 50% support from that group really tells us with a high degree of certainty that your community does support the districts moving ahead with a bond referendum. All right, so if you recall, we then had a recommended base plan, and so we said we had some initial projects that we knew were really the, the need to have. So first, we knew that we needed to build a new elementary school on district-owned land. We let folks know how many kids this would serve and what the cost would be in those features. So we said it would be about a $33 million project, and we said, would you support that? A new clicker. All right, and as you can see here, again, strong support for that building of a new elementary school. 62% of all respondents giving us a nod of yes, with 52% of that all-important non-parent, non-staff group. Now, you might be thinking, what happens with those not sure need more information folks? What we've learned is that typically a third of those folks will move to a yes with additional education. Two-thirds are just too nice to tell us no right away. So you can always look at that group and say, okay, we'll, we'll be able to pull a third of those folks to yes. But again, we've already got a majority with that purple group at 52%. We also let folks know that there was a need to reconstruct both Bishop and Longfellow Elementary Schools. This was going to cost us $33 million for each of those schools. We separated out the question and we said, what do you think about reconstructing Bishop Elementary? 46% from that all-important non-parent, non-staff group. You're going to pull another 8% from that undecided. We also can see that we've got a majority support of 54% from your parents. So again a nod of folks saying yep we support bishops reconstruction as well as longfellow again the number is very similar 45 percent of that non-parent non-staff group giving us a yes and 54 percent of your parents a need to build a new middle school at a cost of 62 million dollars and again, here you can see strong, strong support, 63% of all respondents, but 50% of that non-parent, non-staff, and you'll pick up another 7% of those undecideds. And then we had $2 million in safety needs that we wanted to address. Strong support there, 77% of all respondents, with 71% of that non-parent, non-staff group. All right, so now we've got a simple ranking. So this was in the event that we thought, oh, do we have support for all of these? We wanted to rank order them. So you'll see that these are a simple average. If everyone had said yes, you'd see a 10. If they said no, you'd see a 1. Typically at this point, I'd say to the group, anything that falls below a 5.5 has a leaning towards a no because 10 plus 1 is 11. We divide that in half. As you can see, when we look at all three mutually exclusive groups, you've got strong support for all of the projects across all three groups. But at the end of the day, it isn't just about do we support the projects, it's about 
can we afford it and are we willing to have a tax increase? So we let folks know that it was a $163 million base plan. We identified what that tax impact would be based on various property values. And here you can see 67% of all resident respondents are saying they were willing to accept the tax increase of that $163 million base plan. But as we know, this slide is overrepresented, right? So we need to split that data apart. 78% of your staff are giving you a nod of yes. That's strong support from that group. However, we know that your staff make up that very small percentage of people at the polls. We don't want to say don't go to the polls. We just simply know that as we're looking at your community's tax tolerance, we don't necessarily focus our attention on your staff. So your parents, remember, they make up 25% of folks at the polls. Again, strong support from this group, 77% giving you a yes. 11% are saying no, 12% undecided, you'll pick up another 4% there. So you're sitting at about 81% support from your parents. This slide is really what determines what happens at the polls. They make up 75% of the folks, and the fact that we've got a majority support there is very good. 55% yes, you'll pick up another 4%, with 32% of your general citizens telling you a no. So what this tells us is that you've got strong support for that base plan for all of those projects, and certainly support for that $163 million tax impact. <coughs> We also wanted to test some additional projects because we knew that that base plan wasn't all that we needed. So we had some additional safety and security projects totaling $4.4 million. As you can see here, strong support across all three groups with 64% of your non-parent, non-staff saying, yep, I believe this is something that's important. Then we had your high school um, swimming pools that needed some adjustments and an opportunity to experience some operational savings by closing those middle school pools. So this is the first time we really see that your citizens are leaning more towards a no at this point at that cost of $9.5 million. So as you can see, 41% of that non-parent, non-staff is saying, no, this isn't something perhaps we would support. Your staff are at 50%. So remember I said they've got an important voice. So we like to see your staff sitting closer to about a 70% support of projects because we know they're having those critical conversations. Just over half of your parents are supporting that project. However, if we look, we know you're going to pick up another 8% of yeses with that non-parent, non-staff. So it's kind of a bubble project, but let's see where the other ones, um, you know, where those land. We knew we had to buy some land for a future school building. Again, nice support from your staff and your parents, 51% support from that all-important non-parent, non-staff group. Reconstructing Churchill Elementary, similar to our other elementary school reconstructions. This was going to cost us $33 million. And as you can see here, again, oh, we've got about a dead tie, right, with that non-parent, non-staff group with a yes or a no. Just half of your staff, 52%, are giving a nod of support, and your parents have fallen below that 50% um, mark. So again, this one, we'll just kind of watch and see where this lands. And you've got some outdoor athletic fields. This is probably the first time I can say we've got a leaning towards a no with 55% of that non-parent, non-staff saying, uh, now might not be the time to invest in those outdoor <laughs> athletic fields. All right, then you had some updating that needed to happen in your high school auditoriums. That was going to cost $2.5 million in support there. So 44% of those purple friends, the non-parent, non-staff, 59% of your parents, 58% of your staff. So again, same activity. Simple averages, if everyone had said yes, you'd see a 10. If they said no, you'd see a 1. And in this example, now I can see, look at the things that kind of fall below that 5.5 on that furthest column in the non-parent, non-staff. So really we can see here that reconstructing Churchill, um, the swimming pool projects, and your outdoor athletic fields, likely with that group are things that don't have strong support. But again, at the end of the day, it comes down to project support and how much money are you willing to give us. So if you remember in my early work with you, I talked about those 
two lines intersecting, right? We're going to rank order your projects. I'm going to tell you this is how much money your community is willing to give you, and then we'll see where those lines intersect. So we knew that our $163 million base plan has support, but now we move up in increments and we say, all right, all the way to all in a $219.4 million project. Here's your mind numbing chart. I'm gonna start at the bottom bar so that you understand it, because this, if you forget everything I said tonight, I need you to understand this chart. So that bottom bar tells us that 32% of all resident respondents would support a $219.4 million referendum. So that means that those folks looked at the tax impact on the previous page chart, and they said, I'm willing to support that tax increase. I make an assumption now that if I'm willing to support a $219.4 million increase, I'm also willing to support the 210, right? Because the impact is lower, which tells me that you have 37% support of all survey respondents that, um, that our residents are in at the $210 million mark, okay? Then we add another 11% in there, so we're at 37, 47, 48% support at the $195 million mark. Does everybody get it? All right, the teacher and me. So now we say, um, what do we know? We know that that bottom bar is overrepresented of staff and parents. So we really skip the staff one, although we can see our staff are in at 195 million. That gives us a good nod that we want to get our staff out to the polls. But we really need to focus our attention on those top two bars. So your parents are in at $195 million. Shouldn't surprise us when we looked at their support a couple tables back, right? As far as what they were willing to do when we looked at the, all the projects. But that top bar is really what determines your community's tax tolerance. And so as we look at this, we can see that you've got about 45% of your non-parent, non-staff are in at the $180 million mark. All right, so we're just gonna, we're gonna add those numbers up, the 23 plus the five plus the nine to the eight. And we know that we need to get where in order to have a majority, right? We need to pass the 50% mark. So the 180 million is tight. We would say, all right, well, let's think. Where was their project support and where do those lines intersect? So when we go back here, we say, well, interestingly enough, if we start adding the 4.4 million, the 1.5, and the 2.5 million, we've got about another $8.4 million after the $163 million project. So in essence, those projects have support from the majority of the community in all three groups, and we can tell you with a high degree of predictability that your community is willing to support your base plan plus those three projects. Now you're saying, ooh, we're close to the 180 million. Could we get there? All right, because we can see that you've got strong support, over 50% support, when we start looking at where your $180 million mark is, if we factor in, can kind of do a formula and say a 25% weighting of your parents and a 75% weighting of the non-parent, non-staff. So looking at this, our recommendation is that you go out with an initial question and you think about um, that base project plus those three, and we can see you've got support at that $171, $172 million amount. But is there more support to perhaps tackle one or more other projects? And we would say you may have support, but I don't think you want to put a $172 million project on the line to try and cross over to that $180 million mark. Does that make sense? All right. Questions for me? Director Workman. Yes. Um, I have a question on slide 12. All right. Which, tell me when. It's, it's the one about how you prefer to receive information yep. from okay. the district. Yep. And I don't remember from when I took the survey, people could fill out more than one. Yep. So does this represent all of the choices yes. that everybody filled out? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good question. 
Um, I have a bunch. The Go first one is, um, so we didn't do a randomized survey. So the people who answered were presumably the ones who were really interested or had strong opinions. Um, I imagine you've done this type of thing with lots of districts. Can you um, project then these numbers? Are they highly reliable in terms of the end result? Because it's not really a scientific sample. I mean, maybe a reliable mm -hmm. survey, but it isn't a scientific <coughs> survey. Right. So because I mean, what we want to do is we want to make sure that all subsets of your community are represented. So. If another survey, remember the survey has two purposes. One is to educate, the other is to gather data. Okay, so we were able to educate a significant number of your citizens. So now, do we know that we have a sampling of all the subsets of your community? By asking about age, municipality, all of those pieces, we feel very confident that we've got a good statistical sampling of your community. So then when we start to look at who goes to the polls, but we can see your age groups are all represented. In essence, it's very, it becomes very simple as far as general citizens and parents. You can almost pair it to just that simply. You'll be able to go in and do some additional disaggregation and go, oh, what about these folks? But at the end of the day, after doing this for nearly 20 years, we found that, that you just really almost need to look at those two subsets and with a high degree of predictability, we can see where your community will land. So you haven't had a, 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 another district in the past have the I don't want my taxes to go up people also not answering the survey. Right. And then they don't come out at the last minute and say, I didn't want to give my time to your survey, but I'm going to give my time to vote. No. No, certainly that, oops, not. Sorry. When we that doesn't ever. No, not, no. Okay, that's, yeah. that's a big fear. Were you through? Uh, let, I'll come back. Okay, and, and to perhaps help guide the process, um, if we could maybe allow each board member to kind of comment and then you can circle back around. So the two you have, are there yep. any comments on this end? Director Marvin. Just one. First of all, thank you for your work. And I spent quite a bit of time going over this. I, I think it's really understandable. I'm an English teacher, so that's, that's uh, really good. Um, the other thing I found really hopeful um, is that even at even if people vote yes for what you just presented and the pool, if I have a two hundred thousand dollar house per month, that's eight or nine dollars more for taxes. Which I and I understand people are in fixed income and, and money is important, but I think for for what we're proposing for what we can get, not just for our kids now, but for the next 10, 15, 50 years, it's, it's a good deal. I saw my questions at the meeting last week. Okay. And you anticipated all my questions and covered them, so good job. Great. <laughs> <laughs> not my first time, so see. Yeah. Direct Workman. Okay, I have two more questions. Um, you had not sure categories. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, and I, I did um, ask the superintendent this question because I think it might be helpful for the board or for a potential <coughs> support, mm -hmm. you know, from the community, uh, community. Um, will the comments be available to us and will we be able to see those comments like this is what the not sure people said or this is what the no people said? Because I think those could be very instructive to those who are working on this to actually you know figure out how do, how does the message need to be targeted great question so what will happen is tomorrow morning um, I will will turn on we'll flip the switch so we'll give you all access to all of the data um, I intentionally don't do it before today yeah. because I want to make sure that you understand the data. I've had superintendents call and say, woohoo, and I'll say, oh, you didn't disaggregate the data. <laughs> You're nowhere close to your community's tax tolerance. The other thing that'll happen is that you'll read one comment and you'll go, this is what everyone is saying. This is what I'm hearing all the time. Well, no. It's probably not what you're hearing all the time. You need to make, so I want you to think data first, comment second. So we make data-driven decisions. The comments will always correlate with the data. But you will be able to, and there'll be a little video 
in your email that you're going to get from our system that'll teach you how to disaggregate the data. Wow. So you could go to a particular question and say, I just want to see folks that are, no, I'm not an employee, no, I'm not a parent, and I answered undecided to this particular question. And then those comments will appear at the bottom of the screen. That's if amazing. you get stuck, give me a call. Mm -hmm. and, and then one follow-up question. Well, it's not follow-up. It's a little mm -hmm. different. So slide 26, I believe, was on the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, question, was it clear to folks that this did not include the land? Isn't it? Is that correct? That the price tag on, on the middle school was simply for the building? That because includes the land, land. for Does the that? building, oh, yeah. okay. but not the additional land. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that, okay, yep. great, thank you. I'm done. Um, so back to the flipping the switch part mm -hmm. and that we're able to look at that, and you said just give you a call. Are you going to be here again in two weeks if we're having, no. So if we do have questions just call and we're me trying to, yeah. that's all good. We'll just, and not that, that will be provided right. in the email. Yep. When we, okay, yep. great. So, um. Again, about the fidelity of, of the results. So the slide that had the pretty bars. Mm -hmm. um, Mind numbing? The, what, what you called, I, I liked it. <laughs> um, I liked it too. That one first. Could it be that if we had given them different choices that were all higher or all lower, it would all kind of land at the same place? Like people are like, I don't want to say I'll give you all the money you're asking for, but I don't want to say you're not getting any either mm -hmm. and that they would kind of land in the middle if we had adjusted those numbers up and down well <laughs> what well we can you're fortunate because sometimes it doesn't the data doesn't look as perfect as yours does so as we look at this if we go back and look at this slide um, this is what was interesting to mm -hmm. me so we could draw a line here pretty easily right so remember I said that that 5.5 when we look at this slide mm -hmm. is these are the things that are leaning towards a no from your general citizens and so when we looked at that, I said, ooh, I wonder how much over the 163 we're going to get when we, when we started analyzing that data. Because I thought, you know, um, people when they go through this survey, in some sense, may be saying, yep, I support this, yep, I support that. And they may be adding it up. Then they get and say, I can't afford it. And so and they're going to land on a couple of things. Some people were going to give you a yes to everything and then get to the end and go, whoo, like me at the checkout, right? Woo, yeah. Right? So you start to go, I can't take the shoes home. I got to take the rest of the outfit. Um, so when we go here, we say, all right, um, where, what's the project priorities? And then, you know, how much money? So the fact that you, your two lines of really, these are the things your general citizens are supporting intersects very closely with your community's tax tolerance. So you think maybe people actually have their mental calculators going? I, if, if they were doing it on paper, they could then go back and say, whoa, and then go back and right. change You could toggle back and forth They can online. do that online, mm -hmm. too. Yep. Okay. Yep. So they maybe adjusted right. their answers. And at the end of the day, it really, in most cases, comes down to what's it going to cost me? Right? I mean, people will move through, but then, it, then it's the real, like, okay, this is the reality of where my family's at, of what I can mm -hmm. afford. And so again, when we look at these, it was easy for us to say, here's where we're at. Um, these are the projects that have support. And so the, and the pool is one to talk about. I mean, you know, when we look at the, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a long shot, you can get there. Your tax tolerance is close, but there's definitely a need for ongoing education with your general citizens on the fact that there's some operational benefits and some needs. Um, and, you know, people aren't going pools, schools. I mean, we, you've got to make that connection for them. And that you can do, you know, post-survey now. And so with your experience doing this for, for multiple districts and other mm -hmm. referendum efforts, if you had to say more often going back, I, I imagine you look at the results after election time. If you had to say more often, always, yeah. we were a little <laughs> bit off, would you say it usually leans one way or, or another, or is it just a total toss-up? If, if no, I would off, say that we're the high, we are a high degree of predictability, that the, the text messages come in on election night of, you were off by 1%, ha-ha, mm -hmm. you know, they're very, they're very <laughs> close. And if you, if you did miscalculate, or not you, but if something major changed between the time of the survey and, and the election, More likely maybe. to have stronger support at the tax tolerance. Districts that don't follow this particular chart 
and say, oh, but I think we can get more, often don't have success. So you're usually more pleasantly surprised. Well, the than last election we were 48 for 48. Um, again, in most of them within one to two percent. It's not about me predicting a <coughs> predicting referendum. It's about a school board saying we want to do what the majority of our right. community wants and we're going to move forward with the projects our community is right. telling us they're likely to support. So in cases where um, a school district said, uh, you know, we're going to build a new high school, but Oh, we are hearing a lot of people want the swimming pool. And we say, don't do it. There's not support to add the pool on or put it as a second question. And they say, we're going all in. And then they don't have success if it's over their tax threshold and perhaps not support. So again, that's why in this, in your case, perhaps letting that sink or swim on its own <laughs> makes sense because you're not putting the whole. <laughs> yeah, that was you Kevin was supposed that to laugh. <laughs> you're not putting the whole project at risk. Director okay. Seelinger oh, hasn't yet no. uh, commented. I'm, I'm, I saw Director Marvin and then Director Nathan. Oh, okay. okay. Quick question, and I think you probably covered this at an earlier session, mm -hmm. but I've had a question for, from a couple parents. Um, hopefully when Longfellow and uh, Bishop are rebuilt, do kids continue going to the schools, those two schools now, and the new space is adjacent, and then they demolish? Yeah, and that'll be a great FAQ question as you move, but take it away. I don't get to build the school, I just get to tell you the money. <laughs> so the Bishop site does allow that. The current Longfellow site would be difficult, which is why we're looking at um, some property to the south, and or if we're not able to achieve a, a working relationship on a southern piece, we would maybe move those students into uh, Friedel for a year so that we have the entire site tear down the building, build a new building, and then bring the students back. So we, we have options and opportunities to, to make it work and make it as seamless as possible for both the students, the staff, and, and the construction folks. So, Thank you. Director Nathan. So in your experience, when you've had a component of the referendum, a project where there was a passionate group of people in the community, did including it in the referendum help bring out the vote that built support for the whole package or is it what, what what's your experience with that this? so in this case as we look at this um, what will happen is you still have general citizens who have never stepped foot in your schools will never step foot in your schools but understand the value of capacity and enrollment, okay? So they're supporting those pieces. There are people supporting the pools, and as you look, you've got your parents and your staff that are saying this is important. Your staff, I mean, they are important, but not at the polls. And so as we look at this group, you know, are you gonna move that many people along to a yes? It's gonna be tight. I mean, you know, I wouldn't bet a steak dinner on your pool, but I'm, I'm gonna say, you know, we gotta, they can, they can mobilize and educate and let people know. And I think, in, you know, uh, more education on the operational um, financial benefit <coughs> of closing those schools and, and meeting that need. But at this point, I would say, um, would you, are there people that will be frustrated if it's not an option? Perhaps. You have a group of motivated people that are saying, you know, the pool is important. But again, um, when you look at your tax tolerance and that's your general citizens, where they're at, they're not there yet. Okay. Director Adamson. Um, so I've been involved in quite a few referendum efforts in the past here. And I remember advice from, and this goes to anyone who can answer it, I remember advice from past consultants saying, if you can at all get down to one question, mm -hmm. that it is much simpler for educating the populace. As soon as you go beyond one question, then you have to do a lot of education about which question is asking which thing. Um, and it, it tends to, to confuse the educational efforts. Do you have any experience or insight on we don't shy away that. from a second question. Um, I think in this in this particular case, um, the second question could, if you choose to go this route, would be pretty clear, right? I mean, it's not about multiple pieces. It's about mm -hmm. you know 
is the pool the pool if the pool becomes that second question that's fairly understandable where these other pieces are the things that the community told us they were likely to support these are the things we need um, and and the pool is important the pool projects are important to the district but we just we're gonna let it stand on its own I just I think you just want to be cautious of taking down an entire project when you don't have the majority support there I am one of those people that used to advocate for one question but now that we have the ability to see the data like this and to understand things I actually would advocate for a two question scenario especially on on this project thank you director working um so I don't know is this the appropriate time to ask any questions about how the questions are written on it it's on a different slide or a different I, I don't know we had our legal counsel write them right so. right no I guess I, I was just looking for I, I mean so on the sec on the second question it um, uh, general obligation school building bonds in an amount not to exceed 9.5 million for acquisition and betterment of school sites and facilities including the construction of a swimming pool so I'm and the, the upgrade at Mayo so I'm assuming that those other two pieces of betterment of sites and facilities would include then the closing of the middle schools pools or what what is that little extra thing in there you want to take that one okay. yeah you want me to? so that <laughs> oh no <laughs> Go for it. I will just say the words betterment. We had worked with legal counsel okay. and had suggested they take them out, um, but they ended up saying those are the exact words in the state statute, okay. so they preferred to Going with that write it exactly okay. like okay. that. So it's so it's my understanding then that that the second question um, include is only the pool. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, um, that amount to do pools and the scope of the pools. The scope combined. of the pools, but it's not the turf correct okay um, I I had a lunch with a friend today who said you know I'd love to be able to support fill in the blank but I can't do both of them so that's helpful to to know because I don't think she looked at this point uh, and as you look I mean so the turf is certainly something that again there's going to be people passionate about but as we look here I mean when you look at all respondents well <laughs> below a five that doesn't mean a not ever it just means a not yet and a not now and you know we've got a list and at this point there's not majority support and there's not a tax tolerance there to support it and there's only tolerance really for two questions right not three okay. director Nathan um, the construction of a swimming pool upgrades to the existing swimming pool but there was also con con conversation of what to do with the middle school pools if they were closed is that included in that cost so the, the 9.5 million does include decommissioning those pools, turning them into a different type of space or use okay. for so education the... at those facilities. Okay. So yes. Director I didn't have my hand. See Langer. Okay. So everybody knows I'm the slow processor. So Kevin, since I haven't asked you a question in a while, you can refresh my memory. Um, Churchill. Remind me why we have Churchill on this list and how can the brief how that's going to help impact our overall capacity on that end of town. So when we looked at the different housing growth models that indicated you know a kind of medium, high, and low, um, Churchill would have addressed the high growth pattern and and methodology, and so it starts to um, allow the the boundaries to shift, so to speak, as it goes. Um, it isn't anything that appears to be needed in the immediate future, and so that's why we pulled it out as a separate question outside of the base. And then, if I may um, follow up on Churchill, assuming, and everybody knows Churchill's my home school, and I live down the block, that's why I ask a lot about it. Um, if we expand Churchill, then that impacts Hoover, and then Hoover turns into something else programmatically as opposed to being well the the plan is I mean it's not part of the referendum but the plan is Churchill will become a k-5 school mm -hmm. Hoover will become the Montessori program but that's not something that we communicated in the survey we communicated we discussed yeah, that because before. It, yeah I guess it's kind of somebody made a statement about something the pool what we're gonna do with the middle school pools is more of a management decision really not part of the right. referendum itself gotcha. but it is a conversation that we've had all along publicly multiple times 
throughout the task force work. And if I may uh, echo what the superintendent just said, as we initially started this process, as we probably each recall, there was, we had boundaries, we had programs, we had a number of things that I think we're beginning to actually muddy the waters <coughs> a bit. And I think it's important to, at least for me, to uh, keep the referendum issues as the referendum issues and not merge at this point boundary and or programmatic uh, elements. It's not that we're trying to deceive or pull up fast one on anyone. We know those are things which in their proper time will need to be addressed, but the issue before us is uh, um, before us. Uh, it'll be behind us. Yeah, it'll be behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Director Adams. So um, the, the group that's been meeting frequently that, that the two of you co-chaired, were there any insights or concerns or anything from that group of people that you mm -hmm. wish to share from uh, w with us? Because I think those opinions are really valuable. I think that there was the, the issue of the turf fields. That was a spirited um, conversation. But we looking at the data, um, just said, you know, that's an answer, that's a not yet. It's not a no, but it's just a not yet. Not yet, not no. Not Any yet. other major concerns? Spirited yeah. conversation of an individual of the group. Uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Arm important to differentiate that. It wasn't the whole group, but no, it was it, it one. Wasn't yeah, I think the, <laughs> probably the work. biggest debate that group had was the pool discussion. Do we just drop it all together, or do we have it as a second question? And then uh, there was two groups, and then they eventually came to consensus on, let's put it as a second question. And that's the recommendation that they wanted to bring forward to, to the board. And so uh, is it then true that while there may have been different uh, opinions, uh, when the decision or recommendation was made, there is now agreement and support of the entire group? I think the group vetted it very well. H had some, as we said, lively discussions, but they, they weren't inappropriate discussions by any means. It was just everybody had a chance to be vocal uh, about their personal feelings. And, and part of um, the discussion was, you know, we're sitting at that 5.08, and are we close enough for that piece to be on its own? Um, and yet there's still some education that needs to be taken place. And as a second question, we felt as a committee that we could get the community hopefully to that um, second question and understand the savings um, by taking those pools offline, reconstructing the Mayo High School pool and then building a pool at Century that our community would understand our need by the time we were to get to the polls. The benefit you have with this pool question um, is the uh, concept that it will actually reduce your overall operating costs on an annual basis besides taking a number of deferred maintenance costs offline by decommissioning those three pools. So just the sheer number of going down to operating one pool versus operating three pools, would do, well, <coughs> three versus six, or three versus five, I guess, would be the, the piece. So I just wrote a lot of numbers there, sorry. Taking three pools offline, only bringing one online. That's an operate net operational savings per year, and it's a net reduction in, uh, in your uh, deferred maintenance costs. So that is the story that you'll want to tell the public and explain to the public because if they now realize that that's going to save them money in the long run, now that might be enough to, to make that switch. But that's that education piece that has to happen so that you can maximize that undecided piece. Additional questions? I'll wait to the all board members. So, um, okay. So, Chair Barlow, I think you you helped pull back our discussion, <coughs> but I have to I have to speak my truth. Sure. Um, so this is this is my concern, and I'm actually asking help from my colleagues at the board table because this this is what goes through my head. Things um, like um, reconstructing Churchill impacting Hoover, not part of the referendum, but that's going to be part of messaging. So 
people who may have kids at Churchill Hoover in that area who maybe didn't realize that are going to go, oh, okay, that's, that's going to impact me in a different way. Longfellow, we don't know if we have land. They might go to Friedel. Our Friedel families are like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I want you to build a new middle school, but there's nothing. It's programmatic. It's management to close Friedel, and we're a governance board. But those are the things that are going through my head that I'm trying to reconcile with the great information that you are giving us about the survey because I'm looking at the underneath stuff. And maybe that's not the governance piece, and we've talked about that. So I'm, I'm only pushing back a little on you. You're pushing back on me, which I do appreciate. But I don't know what to do with those thoughts and feelings and questions in my head. You asked for help from your other board members, um, especially as it comes to the messaging for the referendum, because it has been talked about in the past. We are going to probably get those questions, and we're going to have to address them, FAQ, whatever, because, you know, for example, do I want to vote for a new middle school if it means the implication that where my kids are at middle school now are going to end up at that new middle school, and what's it going to look like, right? It's, that, it's the unknowns that we can't answer because we haven't figured it out, but saying we can't answer it probably isn't going to be satisfactory for people to make their votes. So well, yes. that was no help. <laughs> well, I, I guess I would, I would uh, say we're out educating. We haven't hit, hit this at all. It's been from the very beginning the task force have talked about closing or repurposing Fidel. I've talked to students about it when I've been to Fredell for a listening session. Did, did everything that you just talked about at the table has been out in the public more than once, multiple times, and we'll continue having that when we're out educating people about the referendum. We know we're going to get asked, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, we, this, we're going to give you the same message we've been giving you all these months. So it's not like we've been hiding that, then after people vote, we're going to throw it out no, there. No, it's I, been no. out no. very public. It's just you don't put that in your referendum. You're not going to say, would you vote for a middle school if we're going to close? I mean, that's not the way you I, do I that. I understand that, Mike, yeah. and, and just, I don't think you're hiding anything. Yeah. But, I, but I also think it's foolish to think that everybody knows everything that's gone on for the last eight months. And when Kevin says, well, we don't know if those Longfellow kids are going to go to another piece of property or they're going to go to Friedel, I well, who's going to answer that question the, and when? The point, the point um, that I want to... Oh. I just would like... This community has grown tremendously, and, and it will t continue to grow. Um, our voting population has lived through that growth. You take uh, Hawthorne and Holmes. Mm -hmm. Those students lived through that transition, didn't even start the school year at Riverside. They started MEA break those students are now adults with children in our district. You take Century High School, that was two high schools for one calendar year. Half of the kids were at Century High, excuse me, half of the kids were at John Marshall, and half the kids were at Mayo. They were bust to Friedel, flip-flopped halfway through the school day. Those kids now have students in our elementaries and our middle schools. They understand this, they know what this growth is like because they've lived it. So I, I think part of it is educating them, but part of it is understanding they get it. A percentage of our population gets this growth because they've lived it, which is a good thing mm -hmm. because they'll understand that no matter where their child goes, it's the people in the building that are building those relationships that you heard earlier tonight that make the impact on that educational process. So, sorry, my soapbox. No, that's great. That's exactly, love it. Thank you. We're, uh, there were no, I'm responding to your, your comment, which I really appreciate because that, that choice about management and, and governance is, is really important. Um, and what I have done in my mind when I have confronted that particular question about Friedel, because full disclosure, my kids went to Friedel, and they are long out of school, so I'm able to be both objective and subjective at the same time in, in different parts of my brain. 
And I really, really appreciated the experience of the smaller middle school. And I saw the types of kids, whether it was you know, academic needs or whether it was personality or any of those other factors that go into what parents are looking for when they choose one of our district-wide option schools for their kids. And so my answer to myself about what I would do in a management versus governance is I think that it's appropriate for a board to give the type of direction to the superintendent that says we are representing our community's values and our community values are to have an option for middle, middle school students that would, would be a, a better choice for some kids than a, a large, large one. So that was my answer when I struggled with that question about you know, what if it means closing Fidel or what if it means closing one of these, these other district-wide options or adjusting them or moving them. It, to me, it isn't about what building it is. It's what experience we're offering to our students. So that's the kind of reassurance that I would want to offer to parents who had those kinds of concerns at this point was that we may not be able to tell you what your building's gonna look like or which building you'll be in. But if we're hearing priorities that this is really important and it's what's best for our kids, we will do our best to make sure those options remain an option. Does that address what you're struggling with as well? And Mr. Munoz, is that, does that fit in your vision? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had the, the task force have had many discussions and meetings about small versus large and, you know, in a, in a perfect world, I think I said at one of the meetings I'd build 10 really small two-section elementary, but then I also don't want to go ask the taxpayers for $300 million to do that either. So, there, yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's, boy, I'd really love to have this, but then I also have to know what my tax, we learned what the tax tolerance is, yep. and uh, so we, the task force battled that conversation about small versus and not that they disagreed with um, the value of small schools but they also had the data they looked at the data from growth they looked at what it's going to cost mm -hmm. and we know we can't do maybe my philosophies over here but we know as a, as a community we can't afford to do that um, so I, I think we had many discussions about right. this both with the task force and then at the a few of the community uh, citizens voice meetings that we had so uh, I, I don't want you to think or the community to think that we didn't hear them we hear them and we met, probably would even agree if if we didn't have to worry about what it was going to cost yeah. to make that happen but but no disrespect intended I mean yeah. because I I really yeah. do value all of that yeah. that input but but if we're talking about governance model yeah. that decision would rest with the board of whether or not we would want to keep a small program open knowing that it's going to affect our budget and we might have to make cuts elsewhere and I'm not saying that we would I'm saying that's the kind of choices that the school board is tasked with making and they're very difficult and we haven't had that discussion and and by we I mean the seven of us sitting here now because I know you had it with former board members okay if I may uh, certainly uh, simply remind us this is a uh, briefing item uh, survey report has been presented um, are there additional questions that uh, we may have of uh, the group this evening that uh, uh, will help us when it is time, not tonight, to come to a conclusion to vote. Are there additional questions you have that you want to ask of them that they might uh, work on and present? Uh, or uh, is it simply your desire to continue to... Um, I just, if I may... Well, I Dir just, Director Marvin, I I'm sorry, but... Uh, Director Marvin, don't mess please. with me. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a perspective, I think, for the board. It, it sounds to me like the important discussion we're having is more of a messaging discussion we need after we decide that we do want to run a referendum and, and I think we'll have some time to do that and we need to do that um, and I, I think as Chair Barlow said right now we're looking at the numbers and then I think 
at another time we need to have the discussion about the messaging. Mm -hmm. I only wanted, thank you, um, I only wanted to talk process and so, um, and we spoke a little bit in exact about, you know, process for the board. So we're, we're not doing anything with this item tonight. So <coughs> my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, so that we could walk away and go, okay, we've got these two questions, we're gonna look at this information, we're gonna take it all in, we're gonna come back and say, you know, these are the two, these are the two questions that have been recommended and we're good to go with that. Or in two weeks, what, I, I'm just putting options. Somebody says, you know what, I don't like that pool hanging out there. I think we either should lump it in or take it off and the board would decide about that. that that's what I'd like, just yeah, for clarification. Right. Yeah, we, we intentionally brought it this meeting. So if you weren't ready to make decision the second meeting, but that first April meeting, you have to, you gotta land on something because of what has to happen to meet the deadlines. Um, you could, at the next meeting, you discuss, as a board, you say, you know what, we're really not comfortable with the pool. We just redo the, the uh, resolution that night and vote that way. So, so, but you do have, I mean, if you're not at a point where you can make a decision two weeks from now, we do have a little cushion in there for. But you don't need to tell us about the yeah. cushion, but yeah. I just, for clarification okay. for all about yeah. what our options are with yeah. this resolution item. Yeah. Thank you. Any additional comments? Director Workman. Thank you for your work. I know it's been a long, sometimes, what was your word, spirited yeah. discussion with our community <laughs> members who have, who have participated in all of this and for all of your work. I really appreciate how you presented it to us tonight. I think that was very helpful. Um, Kevin, as you know, when you first said we're going to tear down, recommend tearing down buildings, and I went, what? Um, your reasoning was was very good and I think you know if I can be convinced of that and I have been anybody could be so I really appreciate all of the work the effort that you put into it into it especially to help us understand what all of the different options and parameters were even when it got messy so thank you thank you any additional comments uh, I will say I'm, I'm thankful for the uh, data uh, that has helped us um, um, understand where our community is, uh, to take the uh, emotion out of it and simply look at uh, the data as it exists and to understand the various uh, groups. Uh, and for me, it, it was very important to realize that, yeah, there may be, and, and Director Nathan uh, alluded to this, a group that's very passionate, but when you look at who votes or what percentage of that group that is very passionate, not to suggest that, uh, and we as a board, every voice is important, every vote is important, and, and the superintendent has already alluded to, we want everyone to know that uh, we hear them and would encourage them, I believe, to reach out to the board, uh, give us additional uh, input. I think even without asking, I'm sure the community will. Uh, but to understand that uh, uh, it's the data, data-driven decisions that uh, we'll be drawing heavily upon, and I look forward to that. Uh, Director Nathan, then we'll move forward. And I think it's also important for the community to remember that we make the decision about what the ballot question looks like, but our seven votes don't decide whether or not this referendum passes or not. So if there is passion about the ballot question, I would ask the members of the community to carry that forward in the months between whatever the board decides and voting day in whatever direction they want because it's those votes in the community that's gonna determine what happens with this. It doesn't stop here at the board table. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Seven point zero one long term facility maintenance ten year plan update, Mr. Munoz. Yes, at this time I'm gonna call Scott Sheridan, Executive Director of Operations, to provide this information.
Good evening, board members. Good evening. I'm here to provide you, uh, this is an information item regarding our uh, long-term facility maintenance revenue plan, just to give you an update on where we're at. If you remember on July 17th, last summer of 2018, we presented you a 10-year uh, plan. And at that time when I presented it, I explained to you that it's a fluid type of document that changes regularly when new projects arise. And now that we're a little over halfway into the, from that time of a year, um, I wanted to provide you a, a, a new update to, so you had an understanding of what projects came forward in this past seven months, eight months, and now uh, what we're looking forward to doing in, in the next 10 years. What the plan still is, of course, to bring to you a comprehensive plan, highly detailed, far more detailed than what we provided you here today, um, and also a, a bond schedule as well that uh, John from Business Services has uh, created. Um, if you remember that back in November, um, John asked for some reallocation of uh, some past bonds. We've taken those that bond dollars and we've applied them to new projects that uh, and current projects that were on the list. So we, that's what's changed some of the 10-year plan. L later on in this meeting, John's going to ask again for a reallocation of uh, another bond that uh, we have all the bills paid on as well. And when that when we get those monies, we've already kind of reallocated those to different projects as well that are reflected in the uh, updated 10-year plan that you have as well. Uh, there's 57 newly funded projects that we were able to do. Uh, a lot of that's without reallocated money. Other dollars came from where projects came in under budget, and we were able to reapply those uh, that savings into to new projects as well. Uh, we did reduce, take out two projects. One was the uh, Falwell Chillers. We did a reassessment on the chillers that are at Falwell. They're only about 10 years old. We had them assessed. Uh, we don't think they're due for any major maintenance uh, at this time, and so we put them off the list. It doesn't mean that five years from now something might start going wrong and we put them back on, but for now we just think that it's, we're, it's a safe bet to keep those off at least this the next 10 year plan. And then the John Adams Media Center casework we pulled off because we would anticipate completing that type of work in the uh, John Adams wall replacement project that we just refund or we just uh, added to the 10 year plan based on some reallocation dollars. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Uh, it, I'm willing to take any questions. How long are chillers usually good for? Ten years seems <laughs> rather short to me. Very difficult for me to say. Uh, I, I suppose the industry standard is about uh, 15 to 20 years. But uh, some of ours are much older than that. And some are much newer. Director Adamson. Um, so what happens with buildings like with the, I'm sorry, I'm, the question wasn't fully formulated <laughs> in my head when I got called on. Um, the referent and those facilities and, and is it better to put them on the application and then take them off again if we end up tearing down and rebuilding a building or is it better to, is there a financial impact? Thank you for allowing me to think out loud. <laughs> I, I think I understand your question. I mean, are, yeah, the way I interpret it is that are we putting money into buildings that might potentially be torn down if or the referendum passes? We're putting it into our 10-year application and it becomes yeah. irrelevant and, Correct. and then funding for it or planning for it. Yeah, and a good case in point of that is the, the Bishop Indoor Air Quality Project. As you know that you approved a bond for the, the Bishop Indoor Air Quality Project and now once we've gone into this referendum process, Bishop is on the, in, as a potential uh, build a new building on site and tear down the old site. So we put that project basically on hold until we know what happens come November. And so we're, we're trying to be due diligent with the project dollars. 
Uh, we're not, we don't want to throw a bunch of money into a building that potentially could be torn down in the very near future, but we do want to provide a safe and healthy environment for our students, and that is our top priority. So you might see there are some projects on here at those buildings that we do still need to do some work in order to keep them fully functional, safe, and healthy for the students. But if we plan for the money, then what happens to it if we don't need it? If we plan for the project? Yeah. We can reallocate it. We can every year we have to do a ten year plan, so every year the ten year plan looks different. Okay. And it just requires so approval from MDE. Revise it. Yes. And we have that coming up in a different agenda item, don't we? Reallocation? Yes. The yep. Any other questions? No. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sheridan. Approval of bids for Mayo High School parking lot. Reconstruction. Yes, yes. Scott's gonna do that one as well. Good evening, board members. The Mayo High School parking lot reconstruction was part of the uh, long-term facility maintenance revenue projects. It was approved in July of 2018. Uh, and it was uh, originally scheduled to be completed in 2022. We also had a uh, parking lot assessment done in 2015 by WSB, who uh, rated that particular area of the project as well. That was almost four years ago now. That area, the two areas that we're requesting to get reconstructed, the front uh, initial drive, the, the horseshoe-shaped drive that's right by the gymnasium, and then the back dock area uh, near door three. three, thank you, 3A, and the, uh, the maintenance uh, water cooling tower there. Uh, that's, we were gonna have that get replaced as well. Now the back area there by the uh, water cooling tower is made of concrete. The front horseshoe shaped area by the gymnasium is made of asphalt, so it's two different compounds that we're looking to change. Um, but the, the back dock area is, we've been repairing it on a fairly regularly basis over the past many years, and it's to the point where even the repairs aren't holding well enough. There is some high traffic volume there. It's a parent pickup area and drop off and we have a lot of large trucks that come in and out of there where uh, heavy trucks and so it requires a pretty heavy duty surface to that come in and drop at the docks and so that area would be concrete the front u-shaped drive which is deteriorated we were uh, replaced with the asphalt uh, the initial estimate from wsb who designed the project was three hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars we put it out for bids in february and we opened the bids. We received five bids at the end of February, and uh, the low bid was from Comet Con Concrete in the amount of $292,738.50. I don't know where the 50 cents comes from, but uh, so it's, it's actually under budget of what was initially proposed by WSB, the initial architect. Uh, Director Workman. Um, yeah, quick question. Did you just go with the um, lowest bid or did you use the best value process? We went low bid. Okay, thank you. Director Sillinger. Um, two questions, one general, one specific. Um, is the increase in snow and the, the plowing and stuff going to take a toll on our parking lots over this year? Just extra use or? That's an excellent question. I'm not quite sure. I'm more worried about the talk. roofs, actually. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Focus on the roofs. Focus yeah. on the roofs. Thank uh, you. But I, I really don't know. Okay. Um, my second question is, I, I'm not super familiar with Mayo, but that back piece where there's, there's a, seems like there's a lot of parking on gravel, is that still going to remain gravel or is that going to get covered? No, that'll remain gravel. Okay. Director Marvin. Just for information, can the reallocated funds that Mr. Carlson's going to be talking about be used to cover this expense at Mayo? Yes, it, we, we can be used for any long-term facility maintenance revenue. It's a general obligation uh, maintenance bond. It depends what type of bond it is, but this is a maintenance bond, so it would be used for long-term facility maintenance revenue. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, this was a briefing item. Thank you. Thank you. Would it help to move this to action? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So I if you're willing. Second. Discussion? All in favor of moving this to action? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.
did resolve that the school board of independent school district 535 accepts the bid from Comet Concrete in the amount of $292,738.50 for the reconstruction of the Mayo High School parking lot dock area and door one drive through area. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. 7.03 approval of reallocation of remaining proceeds from general obligation facility maintenance bond series 2016C. <laughs> Mr. Munoz. Yes, Mr. Carlson, Executive Director of Finance, will brief us on this agenda item. All right. Good evening, Superintendent Munoz, Chair Barlow, and the rest of the school board. I'm here to talk to you about uh, series 2016C, general obligation facilities maintenance bonds that we issued on July 12th of 2016. When we issued those bonds, we wrote them specifically for indoor air quality improvements at Mighty Oaks Early Learning School, which was Baroque still at that point, uh, Lincoln K-8 School, and at Mayo High School for a partial roof replacement. Um, the way we're writing, by the way, now when we do these resolutions is we're just saying facility maintenance projects on the 10-year plan so that uh, we don't get into this uh, problem again. But what happened was we finished all the projects and we came in $2,810,000 under budget, which rarely happens, but we were very happy that that did happen. And so now we have those monies that we have two options. We can either reallocate them to future projects and just um, spend them on, on qualified projects, or we can put them in the debt service fund and use it to basically lower property taxes um, in the coming year. Uh, as staff, we highly recommend that you allow these funds to be reallocated to other projects so that we can keep moving on getting more things fixed um, as long as we've already issued the debt. Uh, th these projects, these dollars have been earmarked for um, a couple different school sites. So as you uh, look at the resolution, it says uh, Century High School, so a fire alarm system replacement there. Uh, also at Century, we had this discussion last time when we approved uh, for part of the parking lot there. This is the now, I think, the staff parking lot side. Uh, so we now have a funding source for that. I think it's moved up on the list. Gage, replace partial roof at Gage. Uh, at John Adams, replace classroom walls on the third floor, replace flooring, um, and do uh, some doors that need replacement. And then at Mayo, also a fire alarm system replacement. So we think we can get most of those projects in at the $2,810,000 that we already have uh, issued. So that would be the request that you um, approve the resolution to transfer uh, those funds to those schools. Any discussion, Director Senior? Oh, clarifying question then. Um, so we get, we, if if we authorize this amount and then you go bid out those projects and they come in over, then what happens? The balance would come from somewhere else on the 10-year plan. So on our annual pay-as-you-go levy, we'll just okay. move some dollars around. Okay. okay. Workman and Edmondson. Um, yeah. So I have a question. Is that the entire roof at Gage? Um, no. It would only be one section of the roof. Is I it the section of the roof that had <laughs> snow on it or is it a different section i'm sorry to be well, so i believe specific. the whole roof at gage had <laughs> snow on it but, well, uh, okay. <laughs> I, i'm All certain right, it's probably right. yes i do believe it is <laughs> that portion <laughs> of the roof had the Thank snow you, that caused the problem yes, yes. yes. okay, okay. <laughs> director rickman <laughs> asked my question okay any questions on this end and if, again, we do these projects and there remains funds left over, we still have the option to reallocate in Absolutely. sequence. Absolutely. I'd have the lawyer drop another resolution. <laughs> I'd be back here and we'll uh, do it again. But hopefully this is it and this is the last time we need to come and, and do this type of resolution. With you. Okay. Three desire to move to action. So move. Okay. Second. Discussion? All in favor of moving to action? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby authorize the use of an amount not to exceed $2,810,805 in remaining proceeds from the $13,605,000 General Obligation Facilities Maintenance Bonds Series 2016C and authorizes the Execution of documentation relating thereto as provided in attachment A. Move approval. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 
Meeting is adjourned at eight eighteen. <laughs> <laughs>